Welcome everyone. I call this meeting of the House Children and Family Affairs Subcommittee to order. Haley, would you please call the roll? Representatives Bricken, Here. Eldridge, Here. Farmer, Gillespie, Harris, Stewart, Here. Chairman Littleton. Here. Madam Chair Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. So we want to welcome the members and everyone uh, that is here today. And I have a personal order myself, and then we'll see if any of the other members do. Uh, we have Representative Chairman Mayor Kevin Brooks with us today. So let's give him a nice applause. Thank you for being here. We miss you. But I guess you moved on to other things. I'm not going to say better. But <laughs> All right. Do any of the other members have any personal orders? Hearing none, we'll move on to, uh, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Uh, number four, House Bill 2453 has been rolled one week uh, by request of the sponsor. Number five, 2070 has been rolled one week uh, by the request of the sponsor. Number six has been taken off notice by request of the sponsor. So we will move on to how, um, item number one, House Bill 2354 by Representative Garrett. Motion, Properly motioned and second. You are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I am honored today to stand before you and present what's been coined today oh, as. I see you have an amendment too. Oh, we need to let's do that. that. Yeah, yes. I want to move amendment number 013591, Madam Chair. Motion. Properly motioned and second. Does it make the bill? It or? does make the bill. Okay. You want to go ahead and present that and then we'll put it sure, on us? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, for reminding me about the amendment. This legislation is called Noah's Law. And let me tell you why it is called Noah's Law. This is a fella who's three years old. He's a resident of Sumner County. Mom and dad were, well, in some custody issues. There was a current custody matter filed in the Sumner County Juvenile Court System. And mom was the custodial parent. Dad was the non-custodial parent, which means the dad did not have overnight visits. He had very limited amount of time to spend with Noah. One day back several months ago, according to the judge, Noah was supposed to be returned to the, or to return to the custodial mother, Amanda is her name. And the dad decided not to return Noah. Time went by, the family had some inclination that the dad had some nefarious motives that he was not going to return Noah and in fact he did not you all are familiar with the Amber Alert system the Amber Alert system is a federal program that has specific criteria before an Amber Alert can be triggered that Amber Alert can be treated even though it has the same criteria across the country some states define or, or issue th those, that Amber Alert, they, they interpret that criteria a little bit different. Here in Noah's case, the prong that we had, that, that the police officers at the TBI, the Gallatin Police Department had, uh, a little bit of a problem finding was that Noah was in imminent danger or harm, which is the third prong of the, cri of the criteria of the Amber Alert. All three other prongs were met except this one. And with the help of the TBI, with the assistance of the Gallatin Police Department, but primarily with the efforts of Noah's grandmother, Edie Wainwright, who is here today. She's standing beside me, and, his, and her husband, Gary Jekyll, and then Noah's great uncle, Barry Cleveland's here as well. Through the efforts of Amanda, her mom, her mom is a nurse, so she couldn't, she couldn't be here today. She's working. And through the efforts of this family to beg for all of law enforcement to have every tool in their toolbox to find Noah, through social media, through Instagram, we were able to locate Noah in California. One of the problems that we found is that the Amber Alert wasn't issued for about 10 days. It took that long in order for that third criteria, the imminent danger or harm, to be triggered. So the family has met with us, with the delegation of Sumner County, and we have come up with Noah's Law. And so let me explain that to you about what it 
what it does. When parents don't get along and there's a current petition filed in the state of Tennessee, then the juvenile court or the circuit court or chancery court, whichever court has competent jurisdiction to hear a custody issue, and the family has alerted the local law enforcement of a missing child, and the non-custodial parent has not returned that child to the custodial parent in this situation, the father did not return Noah to the mother, and 48 hours passes from that particular exchange date, the judge in this case, in his discretion, can order upon a motion by the mother that since 48 hours has passed, and in this case Noah was not returned, that constitutes imminent danger or harm to this child, which would trigger that third criteria under the Amber Alert. And here's why that's important. We want to make sure that you all receive emails, you all receive text messages, you all receive phone calls. I don't know if you treat emails sometimes like I do, but I will respond to a text message before I respond to an email because we get a lot of emails, right? We want to make sure we do not issue the Amber Alert willy-nilly all the time, right, where people become numb. That's why we've narrowed this legislation to make sure there's a current custody petition filed and it's limited to these circumstances I described before, and here's why. 200 Amber Alerts have been issued between January 1, 2020 and December 31 of 2020. 196 of those have been successful to recover the missing child. So all we can do to assist law enforcement to make sure that hopefully if 200 Amber Alerts were issued, that we have a success rate of 200 children recovered. We know that's probably an impossibility, but it's something that we should strive for. So I offer today for you, on behalf of Noah's family who is here today, Noah's Law for passage so we can assist law enforcement in making sure we use every tool in the toolbox, including the criteria under the Amber Alert, to make sure we find every child that's missing. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll be glad to take any questions. Question has been called on the amendment. All those in favor of uh, amendment 13732 uh, going on to House Bill uh, 2354, say aye. aye. Oh, I read the wrong amendment code. 13591, how's that? I was reading the wrong one, sorry about that. Uh, going on to House Bill. 2354, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. And so did the amendment make the bill? The amendment made the bill, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to welcome you guys to uh, Children and Families today, and we appreciate you being here. And we appreciate you bringing the bill. I think the question's been called for. Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 2354 going out to civil pool. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Chair and Committee. Thank you. Next, we have item number two, House Bill 1919 by Chairman Rudd. We have an amendment that makes the bill. Well, let's get a motion and a second first. Properly motioned and second. Um, so, you, in what was the bill? The uh, I believe it's amendment? 13732. That is correct. So, would you like to describe your? What this uh, bill does, for the last almost seven months, I've been trying to find a solution for unaccompanied migrant children coming in from the border by the federal government. And my bill is very narrow defined. There's, we do not outlaw that since legally we can't. It's the federal government. We can't tell the federal government what to do. We can't even, we have limited ability to restrict their contracts within the state and the agencies they hire. But what this does do is, especially what happened in Chattanooga, where the federal government had contracted a service out of Georgia who had reserved a, uh, I believe it was an old dormitory that housed children and it was later found that those children would be sexually abused and mistreated. What my bill does requires the um, um, children services to 
track them, it would make it illegal to transport migrant ch unaccompanied migrant children in the state or house them without telling the state so that children's services can inspect and investigate housing and to make sure they're being well treated and established a database for this. It does not outlaw the practice. It simply creates a tracking procedure so that we can investigate and make sure the children are being properly housed and taken care of. Any questions? Representative Brickin, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and, and to the sponsor. Um, I certainly would like to, uh, a little clarification. I fully support the concept and, and where you're going with this. My concern is somehow possibly embedded in the legislation will will cause some issues when I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out the foster care parents that so children that are in foster care, if they want to transport their kids out of state, will come under this umbrella somehow. And that I, I would like to get a real clarification that this legislation has no way because Foster care parents, I've got personal experience, have problems getting approval from DCS on, on, on taking their foster kids out of state. And so I would like to get to be certain that this doesn't put more restrictions in that environment. That was the very first question when, um, when I asked legal to draw this up. I immediately gave it at the end of last year before session to Children's Services, and I said, is this in any way going to interfere with adoption, foster care, or child services, or parental rights? And they said, no, it did not. The way this is defined, it would be uh, unaccompanied minor children, that, um, and it would not interfere with, uh, with what you're saying. That was the first thing that occurred to me, and they, they assured me, and legal assured me it did not. You uh, keep saying unaccompanied. In looking at the legislation, I guess I don't see that term. Not, am I missing it somewhere? It's uh, it's not in the code. Uh, it's not in the bill. As I as I understand it, you can ask legal for clarification, but it, that's uh, defined in code. It's I'm, I'm, I got. I guess I'm a little bit lost. You say it's defined in code. But it's not in, in this. It's not defined in this <coughs> legislation, and maybe legal can clarify that for me. So, but I, if if I agree, unaccompanied children, if it if it's for that purpose, I'm all fine for it. Like I said, I'm just concerned that this will will somehow spill over and mess up something else. So, can legal clarify that for me? Michelle Fogarty Legal Services, the bill does not use the term unaccompanied minor, and I do not find that that term is defined in our code either. The bill applies to a child who's transported across state lines to enter into an individual's care who is not subject to the interstate compact on the placement of children, which would apply to adoption and foster uh, children brought into the state for purposes of adoption and foster care. And it also would not apply to children brought into the state under the Interstate Compact for Juveniles, which regulates the movement of juveniles under court supervision. So say that again to me. This does not apply to foster care? It children. does not apply to children who are brought into the state under the Interstate Compact on the placement of children. What about children that are currently in state in foster care? Um, I, it says that then a child who is transported across state lines to enter the individual's care, the individual must provide certain information to DCS within 72 hours. It does not apply to a child who's brought it across state lines subject to the ICPC. Which, but if they're already in foster care, then I suppose it could apply to them. Representative Griffin? I don't know. I'm, like I said, I, I would like 
somewhere before, I mean, we can, to, to, to get that clarified, I'm not sure how to, to I'm still, I'm, I'll, I'll stop right there. We need to go ahead and get the amendment, I think. Oh, we're back in session. And uh, let's vote on getting the amendment on the bill. So all of those in favor of amendment 13732, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. So now we're back on House Bill 1919 as amended. Representative Eldridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> in, in looking at this where it says the, you know, it doesn't apply uh, if you're taken out of the state or something by your parent, step-parent, grandparent, um, would any situation be considered like if there is uh, an issue with, say, the parents are divorced and, in, you know, like in our situation up in East Tennessee, we're right there next to Con Kentucky and Virginia, and let's say the 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 father has a visitation right, but he is not the custodial parent, and he comes and picks up the child, and he say he takes them over into into Kentucky to for for dinner or shopping or something like that, you know, up, up in our area, and and let's say that that there's a lot of tension there with the parents. Um, would it be able to be used as, a, as something against the non-custodial parent in that case? Would, it, would there be anything that in, the, in this that would say that the, that the, like the parent that has custody uses it to, you know, they, they call up and say, you know, they've taken them across state lines. Is, am, am, I read, am I reading too much into this? Uh, let me also address, I said code. I meant the definitions as defined in the bill earlier, not code, but the interstate compact and all the definitions legal was talking about. Uh, again, what legal said, and I asked children services that, this is not going to, trans. like I asked them specifically in this amendment, part of this amendment was uh, brought by uh, children services, and they have a couple of more recommendations on definitions that I'm still looking at. Um, I asked them specifically, will this interfere with the transport of children across state lines from one parent to another or any of their services that they currently do? And they told me no. And sure. this was sick, strictly meant, and I believe it doesn't go outside those bounds unless someone can point to it. Um, it it's strictly meant for unaccompanied minor children transported from out of state into the state in their housing and their care. Chairman Roy, we're going to go out of session again. Since we put the amendment on, we need some clarification by legal, so we're going to go out of session and ask Ms. Fogarty to clarify. Michelle Fogarty, Legal Services. Representative Bricken, under the amendment that we just added, it would this section would not apply to a legal guardian, which would be a foster parent. That's in the amendment that we just added. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Ms. Fogarty while we're out of session? We are back in session. Are there any other questions for oh, Representative Gillespie? You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative, I'm just a little confused here because what we just added on the amendment, what I think I understand what you're trying to do, but I'm still a little hazy. Where, because there, there are just a lot of different carve outs, I feel like, with whether it be DCS custody or federal government custody or the parents, grandparents custody, who and what exactly, can you, can you give me a specific situation where this would have done something, like in the past? Chairman Ray. I guess I'm not fully understanding the question. What's, what's happening now is I'm just giving an example that could be a, uh, an unaccompanied child that's not in anyone's uh, custody except possibly the federal government that is transported across the state lines into Tennessee and is being cared for here or housed here. This would simply allow children's services. It would make it illegal to do so unless you notified children's services and so they could inspect the property. And uh, the state is not taking custody 
they're investigating the home to make sure they're not being sexually abused and they're not being uh, mistreated and the housing meets all the standards of care that the agency already has. Representative Gillespie. Thank you. Uh, you just mentioned, again, kind of where I'm confused again, because in the amendment we just added, unless I'm mistaken, uh, specifically states that if the child is in legal custody of the federal government, this does not apply. So am I misreading that? Chairman Ray. That is not, uh, that is not my, uh, my understanding that it doesn't apply. <laughs> there, uh, the federal government transfers uh, custody to a individual or an entity here. Okay. Representative Stewart. Representative Harris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, all right, so if the federal government transfers a child here, then under this law, they would be in violation and it would be a class E felony on the federal government. Chairman Red. No, not necessarily, not the federal government. It would be a felony if the individual who has contracted either is an individual like a home or a hotel or whoever, what the agency or the individual in Tennessee that has been contracted to take care of these children do not tell. It doesn't prevent them from doing it. It says they must tell children's services and give them the names and address so they can inspect the facility to make sure that it's healthy and they're not being abused. It doesn't prevent the action and it doesn't hold the federal government accountable. Representative. All right, so the federal government does not tell DCS in any kind of way at this moment? No. All right, and then. Representative Harris. Thank you. And so DCS would have to go in and inspect the home that the children are put into. If that's the case, Right now, currently, uh, we have homes that they are currently able to be licensed under DCS, if I'm not mistaken. So DCS would have to go into those individual homes or would they have to just go into, or would those individual homes have to do their own inspection because they're already licensed under DCS to, to do care? Chairman Red. Well, if they're already licensed and DCS has already approved them to house children, then all they would have to let them know is they're housing unaccompanied minors from out of state there. Uh, this is really basically what's going on now is people are, current, people are currently housing either in, in large number or small numbers um, in Tennessee without notifying anyone and we don't know they're here. Uh, it's like we didn't know all the children were in Hamilton County and once they were discovered and people let them know, they went in and inspected a property and found out they were being sexually abused. This would simply require the individuals that are doing this to notify the state that they're contracted with the uh, placement uh, or the transportation agency or the federal government and uh, so they could inspect the property if necessary and look after the welfare of the child, but it does not prevent anyone from doing it. And if someone has already been licensed to house children by the state of Tennessee, they're already inspecting that on a regular basis. Okay, and- Senator Harris. Thank you. And uh, are you adding some amendment or form to address what Representative Bricken was mentioning about unaccompanied, um, like that's not in here right now. Are you adding that in there or is that, was, did I miss, or are we not doing that? at all, or are you just sticking with Representative the language? Harris, we're gonna call DCS up for some clarification. Okay, you okay. okay with that? Yes, I'm so great. So we're gonna go, without objection, we're gonna go out of session and call DCS up. <coughs> so if you could just state your name and who you're with, please. Thank you, Chair Lady Littleton and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jim Lehman. I'm with the Department of Children's Services, and I have uh, Doug Diamond, our, our general counsel at the department, with me as well. Um, wanted to make just a couple of notes um, and wanted to thank and commend the sponsor for working with us on this piece of legislation. Um, there are a couple of things that um, we continue to work on and I don't think are expressed in this final amendment here. But um, a, a few things 
Um, the I think the bill as originally written was um, could be interpreted to have pretty broad applications. So um, children that are just moving across state lines in pretty innocuous um, ways that you know I think m much of the committee and the sponsor wouldn't think should be um, uh, regulated. So we worked on language to more narrowly limit um, the application of the bill, and that's seen in the exemption that was talked about earlier where this this doesn't apply to um, parents, step-parents, grandparents, um, when, when the child's brought into, sent into, taken out of, or sent out of the state by parents, step-parents, and grandparents, or other natural legal guardians. I uh, also want to commend the sponsor. The, the original bill talked about DCS consenting to the children arriving and that kind of thing, and that language, we had concerns about liability and that kind of thing, of us consenting to these um, placements and that kind of thing. So the bill was changed to just simply notifying um, DCS about these things. Did want to note just kind of some things that um, we continue um, to talk about with the sponsor about. There's just significant, um, I think, amount of, of workload as far as investigating um, that's that's placed on the department. Um, with this, and, and that, that's really in section three of the bill. Um, <clears throat> in subsection one, it talks about it's the duty of the department to inspect at regular in intervals without previous notice all child care agencies or suspected child care agencies. That part is in the law currently. What's new is including but not limited to individuals suspected of violating 37.5407. And, and, and 375407 would be a new part of the law that's in this bill. And that's something that Representative Harris was talking about. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we, we inspect folks that we license. So child placing agencies, that kind of thing, that work with homes that place children and that sort of thing. We don't typically, and Doug can correct me if I'm wrong, we don't inspect each individual home that works with that provider that we license. So this would be an additional, you know, th step that we aren't currently taking this inspecting of individuals uh, suspected of violating um, this new part of the code. Um, also in subsection two there, we'd have to interview every child on site who was transported, um, you know, essentially in violation of this, of this new law. Um, we think that could be a, a fairly significant amount of interviews for, um, some uh, of the providers that do this. Um, so uh, I think additional workload there. Um, so that was just a couple of the things that we expressed to the sponsor about. Uh, and those things, this section of the bill was not in the original bill. So those were fairly new things that we were working on. Um, I think on the original question of unaccompanied minors, uh, the, the children are unaccompanied when they enter the country. Um, it, they're not necessarily unaccompanied when they go into the state of Tennessee. Um, and I, I don't know that that's defined in the bill. Um, um, but yeah, that was kind of the answer to that. But we're happy to answer any other questions that the committee may have. Thank y'all uh, for being here. And I, I do have a question about uh, the fact that the kids covered by the uh, interstate compact means these would be minors who would be federally transported. Uh, I, I'm Doug Diamond, General Counsel for DCS. Uh, could you repeat that, please, I will. Uh, Madam Chairman? I said, uh, if the fact that the kids covered by the interstate compact means that they would be minors who would be federally transported. No. Uh, under the two compacts mentioned, those are compacts that have been in existence for as long as I've been practicing law, and they, reg they are complex among and between the 50 states. The federal government is not a party to them. So this, for instance, federal ch children transported by the federal government who are in federal government custody don't fall into that category under either compact. Uh, we use them to receive and send children, to put it sort of roughly, foster children and runaways, on, on foster children for ICPC, ICJ is uh, roughly delinquent children and runaways. So where do the refugee children, where, where do they, where are they, where, where, where do they stand with you guys, with DCS? 
they really don't. We license the facility is all we do. We have no authority to interfere with federal government custody over these children. They pick them up at the border. That's where the term unaccompanied minor comes from. They're not unaccompanied at all anymore. Somebody's bringing them in. It's the federal government who's accompanying them, but they're in the federal, they're in the federal government's custody, and we don't have a lot of. And I guess my other question is, um, the ones that were sexually abused in Chattanooga, who, who was responsible for those children? The federal government and its contracted provider <coughs> would be re mm -hmm. responsible for those children. We are responsible for licensing the, licensing the facility, and as part of that licensing uh, responsibility, we do the regular monitoring, you know, are, are the rooms correct, is it clean, are the, are the staff ratios good? And one thing that they also do is add on an interviewing process for about 10% of the children. Uh, and in this case, as it was kind of as luck would have it, there were about 60 children there, and our licensing uh, <coughs> authority interviewed six of them. Child number six disclosed that a female employee of the facility had been observed by that child, I believe, um, acting up with one of the minor boys there. And Chairman, if I may, I think um, th this was said in the study committee over the summer is that there's no requirement in the current law, and Doug can correct me if I'm wrong, but no requirement in the current law for these for us to be notified of these folks coming into the care of people when they enter into Tennessee. Um, and I think that's what the, the bill tries to accomplish, um, at least in part. Mm -hmm. um, now we do, we are able to take, ask for censuses of, of places that we license, um, you know, so we, we have that ability now, but there's just no automatic notification or, or anything like that. And that's part of what the bill accomplishes uh, or seeks to accomplish. Um, I think it's the additional inspection type things. Some of those are, are the concerns, or at least we want to be sure that those things are reflected in the fiscal note, um, the additional, um, inspection type thing, so. Thank you. Representative Harris. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so as it currently stands, are you all supporting this bill? Are you okay with the amendments that have been placed on now at this very second, or is there anything that? As currently stands, we are still working with sponsor. Um, we were uh, hoping to work on some of those concerns about inspecting of individuals that we don't license. Um, was the primary thing that we wanted to work on. Um, I can't, D Doug, is there anything I'm, I'm missing there? No, I th inspection and, I'm uh, sorry, Doug Diamond, general counsel, inspection and interviewing were the primary and it, we're interviewing. Mm -hmm. issues that we had with the bill. One would be a resource issue, the other is uh, different. We don't usually, uh, we don't investigate individuals usually suspected of violating trafficking laws. I mean, we might, if, they, if they had a, if we had suspicion of child abuse, we would definitely want to in, uh, inspect or interview them. Thank you. Paris. Thank you. Is that okay? Okay. Representative Eldridge. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, let's, let's go back to your comment that you made. You're licensing a facility that you have actually no control over with the, when they're fed, when the children are there, brought in there by the federal government. Is that what I understood you to say? I may, uh, Doug Diamond, do you want me to say my name every time, Chairman? <laughs> I'll go be ahead. Happy. You hadn't been here for a while, so you <laughs> okay. remind us of who you are. <laughs> um, yes. Um, no, th there's, it, you license it to make sure, and the statute is written that if a facility, upon a licensing review, if it complies with everything you need to get a license, so you've got to have X number of staffers per children, you've got to have background checks, you, you have to, once a, once a facility demonstrates to the department it has done what it needs to do to get licensed, we are required to license the facility. Uh, we have control in the sense that we license them, we go out, and as long as they fulfill those licensing requirements, that's sort of the end of our authority. We do not control, uh, by and large, who would go there. I, I don't believe if the, if the facility, facilities, for instance, take private pay clients to children. A parent can put a child sometimes into facilities. We don't necessarily know that that child is there. If we take a census, we might see that the child's there, but we don't control the movement of that child to the facility by the parent. And in this case, we've got the federal government acting essentially in loco parentis. 
Business Administration. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I'm, I'm just a little bit confused as to, as to I, I mean, we're, it sounds like we're licensing a facility and then, the, you know, just because these, these children are in, in, quote, the custody of the federal government, you, you, you don't have the, uh, the ability to go in and inspect or I'm see sorry, who's there Dan, or... We have all, all the authority there we'd have in any other facility to inspect and, and license. Uh, what we don't control is the placement of children into this, the facility and the dispersal of children from the facility. Their custodian controls that, who has a contract with uh, the facility. So long as the child meets the population for which this facility is licensed, that's, that's sort of the, the end of our role in the process. Okay, thank, thank you. Representative Brecken. I'm going to kind of add to that, but I got a little confusion. Um, could the federal government bring in a group of minors and place them in an unlicensed, unregistered facility, just put them in a motel or that's, and leave them there, park them there for a couple of days and then transport them out without y'all know about it? Mr. Dodd. In, yes, in theory, I suppose they could. If we had a group of children in the situation that you describe and someone reported it to us, they're in and without any apparent guardian or custodian that we know of, and we can then view them as dependent and neglected children, and, take, and they could come into custody that way. Um, if they've been abandoned, we're going to take care of them. Representative Brickin? Are there any other questions for DCF? Here and then we'll go back into session. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Rudd. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I think that answered a lot of your questions and why I'm bringing the legislation. I'm trying to give them the power over Tennesseans who may be uh, control of these properties so they at least tell them they have them so they can inspect them and give them investigative powers. Um, it could have a, um, a larger fiscal note giving them investigative powers and I'm working with them and legal to see if uh, the two or three minor word changes uh, is going to change the bill and take that authority away or whether it's going to have a larger fiscal note. And if it is, that's something we as a people need to think if we need to give them the resources to take care of this. Um, again, uh, like they said, uh, we currently do not know when the children are here, how long they're here, or where they're housed by the federal government or their contractors. This would give them that power to investigate it, and it would make it, um, it would make it a crime for anyone to do that without at least notifying them so they know that the children are there. Are there any other questions for Chairman Rudd? Hearing none, are we ready? To, oh, Re Representative Brickin. <laughs> I'm, um, if the federal government or, for that matter, uh, a minor sm smuggling ring brought kids into Tennessee and just abandoned them. They would become wards of the state. I mean, the, I'm almost concerned that the federal government would use a strategy of just bringing them in and dropping them off and saying goodbye. And next thing we know, we we have the responsibility. I mean, is that even is that a certain possibility? Uh, I, I guess that's not something I've addressed. I don't know the federal government is purely abandoning them. Uh, if, that, if they did happen, again, if a child was abandoned in Tennessee and the state wasn't notified, they wouldn't know to take care of them. This would at least require them to be notified so we'd know they're here. Um, what what uh, currently, as they've stated, that they, uh, they, they investigate like properties but this would also include in the bill individuals that are housing a child because the federal government after Chattanooga, the, the placement agency, what they did is rather than lease a hotel or a dormitory or house a large number of children, they went to house them individual homes, one child per home. So this would give them the power to those individuals in those homes would have to report to them as well that they're housing a child so they can investigate the home to make sure it's, it's a proper environment for them.
All those in favor of House Bill uh, 1919 as amended uh, to go out to civil justice. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. The no's have it. Bill fails. Next, we have item number three by Representative Smith. Properly motioned and second, and I see that you do have an amendment. I do have an amendment. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. It is uh, drafting code 13992, and I will bring attention to the committee that um, there is a updated fiscal note that's not yet in the system that I just want to make sure that you're aware that it does not have a fiscal note. So I'll be, I'll explain that when I'm, when, when you tell me. Does what? the amendment make the bill? It makes the bill, okay, yes. So, <clears throat> so I need a motion and second on the amendment. Properly motion and second. Uh, we'll be voting to put Amendment 13992 onto House Bill 2418. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. So you are recognized. All right, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Committee. Uh, currently, and I want to thank the uh, the Conference of Circuit Court Clerks for allowing me to, to carry this bill. It's an update or a modernization of uh, looking at some what's called the mon monument, monument of title. And this is a, a, a transfer via paper of real and personal property. Currently in our Tennessee Code annotated, there are two ways for a will to be probated. One is the common or regular probate where the, the will is proven in, in court through the verification of a document. The second would be in the monument of title where your transfer of real and, and uh, personal property is done without a will and it permits a limited transfer within a window of time. This gives uh, the particular bill that we have will uh, create a reporting mechanism to the creditors, to the families that are named in the will as well in, in the estate, as well as uh, putting a year limit on the time uh, to, to allow their, the uh, court to make sure that creditors are indeed paid with the, uh, uh, by the uh, I guess, the assets of the, of the state. Any questions for Representative Smith? You're none. Are we ready to vote? You, Representative Stewart, you're recognized. I, I just want to say, I, I asked you about the Bar Association. I looked into that myself, and it sounds like there wasn't a, I'm not representing anything for that organization. But, uh, having looked into it, I don't have any problems with the bill. It makes mm -hmm. sense. So. Any other questions? Hearing I just none? want to thank, thank, thank him. And, and the, the Bar Association has been notified, and, and no one has fussed. <laughs> so are we ready to vote? Questions. All those in favor of uh, House Bill 2418 as amended, moving out to civil justice full, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Eyes have it. You move up to Thank the you, Chairman. And mm -hmm. Now I'm going to pass the gavel down to uh, Chairman El uh, Eldridge. Okay, members. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we are on House Bill 2023 by Chairman Littleton. Motion. And I see we have an amendment. Drafting code on that amendment is uh, 13942. That's is that correct. correct? It is. And the amendment makes the bill. Amendment makes the bill. Let's go ahead and put the amendment on the bill if motion. we could. We have a motion. We have a, do we have a second? Second. Okay. Um, okay, all in favor of the amendment one, okay, all right, Where we have it on the bill. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, Chairman Littleton, if you would, uh, give an explanation of your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this uh, bill says that a landlord or person in control of a residential rental property shall provide a case manager for the Department of Children's Services or a child protective investigation team with information, if known, on the address or location of a child who has been alleged to be abused or neglected and resides or is located on the residential rental property. It also says the landlord or person in control of a residential rental property 
is not liable in any civil or criminal action that is based solely upon the cooperation with the investigation by the Department of Children's Services or Child Protective Investigation Team, except in cases of willful or wanton duck, uh, conduct or intentional wrongdoing. So this was brought because there was a, a little boy that the landlord refused to tell him what apartment he was in, and that night that little boy died. And so this says, just says that they can tell them what apartment or, or house that um, this uh, child lives in without any liability to them. All right, committee, we've heard the explanation. Is there any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, uh, we're ready to vote on House Bill 2023 as amended, and it'll move out to civil full. All of those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Moves on to civil full. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, next up, we have House Bill 2024 by Chairman Littleton. We have motion. We have we have a second. Say so, second. Uh, Chairman Littleton, you are recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill requires a, a child protective team uh, convened by the Department of Children's Services to conduct an investigation if a report of ser severe child abuse is received. It expands certain st statutory responsibilities of a child protective teams to include severe child abuse in addi uh, addition to child sexual abuse and requires each district attorney general to include information on severe child abuse and their yearly progress report to the General Assembly. All right. Committee, we've heard an explanation of the bill. Are there any questions? Chairman Bricken. Uh, yes. Uh, for the sponsor, can you just uh, kind of summarize uh, what this bill does that we currently don't have in legislation? It seems like all this should have already been in legislation. Chair Lady, you're recognized. It's just... Uh, it really just codifies it and redefines the language of what sexual abuse is and severe sexual abuse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on House Bill 2024. It'll move out to civil full. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? The ayes have it. Moves on to civil full. At this time, I'll pass the gavel back down to Chair Lady Littleton. That finishes our uh, calendar, but we have some spe uh, presentations this afternoon. The first one is with the Joint Task Force. We're going to go out of session. The first presentation is by the Joint Task Force on Children's Justice and Child Sexual Abuse. If you guys would please come forward and introduce yourselves and who you're with, please. We thank you guys for being here today, too. Ms. Fair, due to time, would you like to go ahead and start your introduction as everyone's getting seated? We, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present to your committee today. I'm Lynn Farah. I serve as the president of the Joint Task Force on Child, Children's Justice and Child Sexual Abuse, and we have a, a PowerPoint for our presentation. In 1985, the Tennessee General Assembly enacted legislation requiring the Tennessee Department of Children's Services, DCS, and the Joint Task Force on Children's Justice and Child Sexual Abuse to develop a biennial state plan addressing Tennessee's response to child sexual abuse and other forms of severe abuse. DCS collaborates with the Joint Task Force, which is a group of 48 
child welfare, juvenile justice, health care, and mental health professionals statewide who are appointed by DCS Commissioner Jennifer Nichols. I am Tony Lawall and I am the coordinator for the Joint Task Force and I will share uh, the accomplishments over the, the past couple of years. Uh, 12,651 adults received child sexual abuse training in Tennessee. 14,978 people completed the child abuse mandated reporter online training. 15,975 public educators completed human trafficking training. 1,841 foster parents attended the 2020 uh, T Tennessee Department of Children's Services Foster Parent Virtual Conference. 708 law enforcement personnel completed human trafficking training. 588 people attended the 2020 annual Virtual Connecting for Children's Justice Conference. There were five safe baby courts were established statewide to address the unique, the, the unique needs of families with infants and toddlers who are involved in the child welfare system, bringing uh, the state's total to 12. And also DCS rolled out child sexual abuse workshops in Middle Tennessee for DCS staff and SIPIT partners to investigate cases involving child sex abuse. Also DCS investigated 15,133 allegations of child sexual abuse and 433 allegations of commercial sexual exploitation of a minor. The goals of the 2021 T Tennessee Sexual Abuse State Plan will be presented by the chairs of each of the committees of the Joint Task Force. And the first one is the CIPIC Committee. I'll ask Tom Miner to come present. Thank you. Thanks for being here. If you could state your name and who you're with, please. I'm Tom Miner. I'm a retired assistant district attorney, and I'm a chairman of the uh, CIPIT committee of the Joint Task Force for Children's Justice. Uh, 1985 was a big year in Tennessee for children. At that time, the legislature passed a huge package of laws, uh, which are still recognized by other states as creating a cutting-edge effort to protect children in the state of Tennessee. Uh, part of that effort, uh, which was codified in uh, TCA 37-1-601, uh, was section 604, which created the SIPIT teams. You have mentioned uh, SIPIT teams a couple of times here already today. Uh, SIPIT stands for Child Protection Investigation Team. The original legislation required that uh, child sexual abuse investigations be conducted by teams as opposed to what had been happening prior to that time, which was uh, DCS would investigate the civil aspects of it. The uh, law enforcement agencies would investigate the criminal aspects of it. And uh, people who were victims of child abuse um, might be dealing with representatives from two or three different agencies conducting separate investigations. The SIPIT legislation required that uh, joint investigations be conducted. The way this takes place now is that uh, reports of child abuse, child sexual abuse are made to the Tennessee Department of Children's Services hotline, that the Department of Children's Services is obligated to organize or call into uh, being the SIPIT team. That team consists of representative of the Department of Children's Services, representative of a local law enforcement agency, district attorney's office, uh, juvenile justice system, and now in all of our counties that we have uh, child advocacy centers that are involved in that process. So the purpose of that is that these agencies are working together multiple heads are better than one, and it saves individuals from having to deal with these agencies separately. So we feel like we get a better product as a result of that. The purpose of the Child Protection Investigation Team, uh, we serve the Department of Children's Services at the uh, behest of the, the commissioner and by appointment through the governor. Uh, the members of the task force or the SIPIC committee of the task force 
or uh, DCS personnel, uh, law enforcement personnel, district attorney's office personnel, child advocacy center representatives, and uh, medical providers who work with children who have been victims of abuse or who hold supervisory roles have experience in the field. And it, it is our in intention to attempt to identify problems that are coming up in the uh, children's investigation area and to uh, work on solutions for those problems and to get those uh, solutions out to the people who are participating in the SIPIT teams in the field. Uh, some of our recent work, we have um, previously produced a uh, best practices manual. The purpose of that manual, which was circulated statewide, was to talk to the law enforcement agencies and DCS, other members, about how to organize their team, provide them with information related to the uh, statutes that they operate under and DCS policy, and provide them with uh, protocols for the conduct of their investigation based on experience that had proved to be successful in the past. Within the last year, we have endeavored to update that manual, which was five or six years old, to uh, provide um, more recent information about beneficial practices, changes in the law, and such as that. Uh, in addition to that, we've been working on a protocol for medical people who conduct uh, child sexual abuse evaluations, trying to standardize that across the state. We have uh, a, a few agencies that provide a lot of those examinations, such as our kids here in Nashville, but we also have in our rural areas uh, occasions when local physicians who are not necessarily specifically trained in the area of child sexual abuse are conducting those investigations or those examinations. So our committee, which has members of uh, our kids and other medical providers in the field of uh, child sexual abuse, are trying to prepare a protocol that those providers, those medical providers could follow in conducting those examinations. Uh, in addition to that, we look into other areas uh, where we think we might be able to, to offer uh, advice to DCS or assist DCS in conducting uh, their endeavors. Uh, one problem we know DCS is having right now is a, a personnel problems related to, to COVID and other matters. Um, and we're, we're talking about issues related to recruitment, both with DCS workers and uh, medical providers, as we have a situation in Tennessee now where we only have uh, four doctors who are board certified in conducting uh, child abuse examinations. So that's been the work of the task force as far as the civic committee is concerned for the last years. Questions? Thank you. I think we've done a little bit of work with the CIPIT uh, this year, so we're hoping to get it across the finish line on the floor pretty soon. So, uh, and I'll have to say I enjoyed some of the soup at the Sunday soup Sunday too. So I've been participating in that before I even knew what it was. So it's, it's a great day for our kids and we do appreciate what they do. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? We'll move forward then. I'll ask Kathy Sinback to present on behalf of the Court Improvement Committee. Can you hear me? Hi, um, it's great to see everyone. Thank you for having us, um, Chairman Littleton and the committee. Um, my name is Kathy Simbach and I am the court administrator for the Davidson County Juvenile Court for Judge Sheila Calloway and I'm honored to be the chair of the Court Improvement Committee of the Joint Task Force. Um, our committee consists of a variety of people with great, a great deal of knowledge about the juvenile justice system. Um, from judges, juvenile court judges, to a member of the um, Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. Um, we have the, um, we have practicing attorneys, we have experts from the administrative office of the courts, and it's just a great, um, just font of knowledge um, on, on best practices in juvenile justice. Um, we are specifically um, aimed at uh, developing 
practices that are going to make it easier for people to testify, specifically in neglect and dependency cases, to make it where the courts are more um, accessible, where they're um, more um, user-friendly uh, for people in the community to, to really um, get justice um, in those areas of child abuse and neglect. And um, one of the things that we've been working on um, for some years is um, maintaining a curriculum for social workers as witnesses um, at the court to um, ensure that they are testifying in a way that's consistent with law and also that um, makes them comfortable in presenting some really difficult issues to courts. Um, we suggest topics to the Juvenile Court Judges Executive Committee um, for training, and right now we're really focusing on um, practices related to non-custodial um, services uh, that are provided by the Department of Children's <coughs> Services and trying to get some um, consistency in, uh, for example, immediate protection agreements, um, which is when uh, a youth is not put into custody of the department, but they're placed with another relative or a, a person, either a family member or a friend of the family, um, to have a safety plan. And we want to make sure that those, all those procedures are being handled consistently throughout the state. We also really work to um, provide guidance and support to children who come before the court in neglect and dependency cases. And currently, we have a very exciting project where we are putting together a booklet um, for youth who are coming before the court in um, child abuse and neglect cases. And we're working with the uh, Metro Arts Commission, uh, which has a restorative arts program. They've actually been able to engage um, some youth who were formerly in foster care um, one of them is, who's leading the project is now um, at UT um, in college, and she uh, spent several years in the foster care system and is now helping us um, with the artistic design and also the content of this guidebook um, to make the process less scary for kids who have to go before the court in neglected dependency cases. Um, we have some other projects. We are working on pro se petitions to make it easier for private parties without attorneys to go before the court and make neglect and dependency um, allegations. And we're just always trying to come up with ways um, to make both the children and the adults um, more comfortable in accessing the system. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you for Thank you. being here. We do appreciate what you do. So we appreciate you. you. Thank you. Um, Lori Paisley is here to okay. report on the outreach and Public Awareness Committee. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and Committee. I am Lori Paisley, a Joint Task Force member, but I am representing the Outreach and Awareness Committee. And as you see on the screen, what we do is we do educate and inform the public, also child care providers, schools, um, child welf welfare professional groups, law enforcement, health care organizations, and other groups about child welfare related child welfare resources, and training opportunities. So some of those have been, the successes have been shared already, but I wanna give you some specifics that our committee's been able to do. Um, as you may know, April was Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month, and Nurture the Next developed a digital campaign which included a video on preventing child abuse. They have a library of videos for parents, but that one in particular is specific on how to prevent child abuse. Um, in partnership with DCS, which we've mentioned before, we were able to promote that national event of Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month to the faith communities, encouraging them to take an active role in child abuse prevention. And also in partnership with DCS, our committee assisted with the development of a document, Keeping Children and Families Safe During COVID and Social Distancing. And in August of 2020, that document was disseminated to all school districts across the state, as well as to all state child-serving agencies, the courts, other educational professionals, and some of those are University of Tennessee Extension staff who serve our children across the state and youth in all 95 counties of Tennessee. The committee also updated the Aaron's Law guidelines which included information on what Aaron's Law is, child sexual abuse prevention curricula for pre-K through 12, and other child sexual abuse prevention resources, as well as a resources list 
for selected national organizations, and then a resources list for child care providers. And all of those resources were vetted by DCS and the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments? Representative Brickley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, kind of going back to the beginning of your presentation, I, just a general question. Um, organizations like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, are, are they under y'all's domain as far as being certain that they have uh, proper uh, child abuse training programs uh, within their organizations? I mean, how, I mean, how, you had, I forgot when you had night, whatever your statistics were for training uh, statewide, I didn't know if it covered all those type of organizations or not, just. I don't know if you wanna talk about that, Scott. I think one of the things that we are, one of our main goals for the Joint Task Force to ask our legislators is to always increase our opportunities for public awareness that would incorporate all of the different child serving groups. So there's been a lot of progress on that. The Department of Children's Services has a mandated child abuse reporting um, video on their website that can be available to anybody who is working with children so they understand the dynamics of child abuse and how to prevent it and how to report for it. So that's something that, that is readily available and that we are always talking about public awareness. And I, I think as Ms. Paisley said about outreach and awareness, they're doing things in <laughs> schools, they're doing things through child groups, you know, and, and trying to really saturate our state with the awareness of child abuse and how to identify and report it. Maybe I need to clarify, Madam Chairman. Is Boy Scouts, I use, I'll say with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and I'm certainly familiar with the Boy Scout vetting program and for any uh, leaders uh, in scouting today. But is that strictly because they want to have those programs in place versus being required by either the state or the federal government to have them in place? Ms. Farrow. That's an interesting question. So in Tennessee, every citizen of Tennessee is mandated to report child abuse to the Department of Children's Services. I'm talking about training. I know. So okay. it is our job to make those training opportunities available. Now, whether we, we focus on one particular area or not, it, we want it made widely available so all schools and all child groups have the information that they need so that they can fulfill their responsibility to report child abuse reliably to the Department of Children's Services. I'm going to throw one more kind of turnaround okay. question. Okay. Are there any large agencies or organizations in the state that uh, involve children that you are aware of that don't have, that doesn't have, uh, child abuse pr training programs that needs to have? I think all of the organizations that I'm aware of who serve children are aware of the, necess the necessity of providing that training to recognize child abuse and to report child abuse. I know that um, I am Tennessee CASA, the executive director of Tennessee CASA and our entire network works to train the communities on the fact that child abuse exists in all of our communities and the importance of us protecting our children. I know the Tennessee Children's Advocacy Center has a similar mission that they do lots and lots of training um, in every venue of every community that they can get to. So I think all of us have that as part of our mission. Well, I understand. I just kind of wanted that to be certain there wasn't anybody that y'all were aware <laughs> of that was n not providing the training that y'all thought they should in their organization. Yeah. And we have um, at least 50 members and represented all state child serving agencies, nonprofits, and we try to uh, disseminate our information uh, widely through those uh, resources. And also, I wanted to add that I was once a volunteer for Big Brothers and Big Sisters. I've investigated child sexual abuse for over six years and worked with the department for a very long time uh, on child welfare, and I had to go through training. It was mandated. That was part of the uh, volunteer training uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. 
I believe there are a few bills out there and on a few more mm -hmm. <laughs> this year. So we've tried to c cover all of those. Uh, I think most of them are going to come out of our committee. So we certainly made a lot of progress, but we can Definitely. always do more. So right. we thank mm -hmm. you for that. Even attention. if we just kind of add to them, I think um, as we go. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask Melissa McGee to um, present on the treatment committee of the Joint Task Force. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Melissa McGee. I'm a mental health ther therapist counselor, and I have the privilege of working with the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth and being a participant in the treatment committee of the Joint Task Force. We had two main planning objectives for our committee. And the first one was to expand the work that we've already done related to therapeutic practices and the needs for, for services for those youth, youth who have experienced commercial sexual exploitation or probably, as you better know, it, human trafficking. So we're excited to report that we completed a literature review of um, what is going on out there with the, the child uh, commercial sexual exploitation. Um, and that uh, white paper, as we refer to it, was presented at the Connecting for Children's Justice Conference that you heard Tony speak of earlier. It was widely received very well. We got great feedback. And that document is really um, aimed more towards support for our DCS workers, our child service workers, um, the helping professions. It's not really one for just general public. It's really around just educating folks on that particular um, issue. Our next objective, uh, we are gonna kind of create some shorter briefs around that document. It's pretty vast right now. I think it's about 40 pages, 40 um, but we're gonna pr uh, develop some briefs to better educate in a, a more succinct fashion. And one of the next thing that we're gonna do is start to work on a document that um, addresses children with sexual behavior problems that helps outline languages that can be used with them, assessments and interventions that are most appropriate. One of the hardest things in treatment right now is there's not um, a wealth of evidence-based treatment processes or protocols for kids who have experienced this and so we hope to help provide just information around what is available out there and identify what may be available that we're not aware of just yet. Thank you. Any questions? Remarks? Because we are appointed by Commissioner Nichols, I want to introduce um, Carla Aaron who's here with DCS. She's our leader at DCS that works with the Joint Task Force. So I just She's wanted to- She's our leader too. <laughs> she is. <laughs> Welcome, Carla. And so one of the things that we want to say about what our legislators could do to address child sexual abuse is exactly what Representative Bricken brought up, is we always want to raise public awareness about the necessity of that child abuse exists in all of our communities, and we all need to be aware of looking for the signs of child abuse and how to report that to the Department of Children's Services so it can be investigated properly. But I just want to say to you as the committee, Chair Lady Littleton, I appreciate all the intentional thought that you're giving to every aspect of children and families in the state of Tennessee. I watch the committee meetings every week, and I just appreciate all the work that all of you have done for that. We try really hard here. <laughs> What do we say? If we, we want to save every child, but if we do it one at a time, that's what we have to do. So, and it it takes us all. So maybe it, if each of us could save one child, <laughs> it makes a, a difference each and every exactly child. Right. Well, we really appreciate y'all being here and the work that you do. We know it's very important, and you know we're beginning to see some of the results in the past four or five years. A lot of the results of, of hard work and sad work and lots of reading reports, but uh, it is paying off, so. But it's, it takes us all, there's uh, one person can't do it. I say up here there is no I, it's all a we, so you, we are working together, so thank y'all very much. Absolutely, thank you for allowing us to come and present to thank you. Thank you for coming. Anyone else? No? Thank you, thank you. So now we have Ted Cornelius with YMCA. If you'd like to come forward and state your name and who you're with for the record, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, and committee members, too. My name's Ted Cornelius. I'm the executive director of the Tennessee State Alliance of YMCAs. And I appreciate the opportunity to show you a short video today that demonstrates some of the uh, community impact that Tennessee YMCAs played during the pandemic. Uh, in our Tennessee communities. So I'd love for you to see the video. Thank you. At the Y, 
by strengthening community as our cause. Every day we work side by side with our neighbors to make sure that everyone, regardless of age, income, or background, has the opportunity to learn. Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you You want to write essays that inspire, messages that forge brighter. Sorry, this is a YouTube link, so for some reason something popped up on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. At the Y, strengthening community is our cause. Every day we work side by side with our neighbors to make sure that everyone, regardless of age, income, or background, has the opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive. Simply put, the why is for everyone. We believe that keeping our doors open to all only strengthens our YMCA and its ability to meet the needs of the communities we serve. During the pandemic, we realized there would be a need to support our essential workers so they could stay on the job serving their communities. The YMCA worked with us to provide free child care and YMCA locations across the state for school-aged children. And it made a real difference in our communities that needed these essential workers available during the pandemic. My name's Tasha. I'm a single mom. I have two kids. Xavier's 10 years old. He has um, autism, but he's on the Asperger's side. He went to the summer day camp for essential workers. He just fell in love. Absolutely loved it. He's been in love ever since. It can be hard, especially if you don't have family or friends to rely on. Um, if school is out, like, you just gotta either not work or, you know, fret who's gonna have him this day, bounce around this, that. You lose that structure. He was able to have fun, but still learn and, and keep that structure and that balance. And it, it was, it was life changing. Really, it was amazing. In Tennessee, one in six children experience food insecurity. That need for meals has only increased during the pandemic. Tennessee YMCA's were proud to serve healthy meals and snacks to the children and families in our communities. For years, our YMCA partners at locations across the state have served Tennessee children by providing important meals through both our child and adult care food program and our summer food service program. Many families depend on these locations for breakfast, lunch, and supper. We couldn't provide these meals without the help of organizations like the YMCA. Not only did Tennesseans have to navigate a once in a century pandemic, but several communities experienced natural disasters during the last 18 months. Our Ys showed up to serve their communities by providing housing, food, donations, and a smile beneath our mask during these times of disaster. My name is Jenny Crockett. I live in Cookville, Tennessee. This is where I've made my home for, I guess, more than half my life now. So we, of course, went to bed like everyone else in Putnam County on March 2nd. In the snap of the fingers, um, we were lifted up, put down in the backyard, and the rest of our house was on top of us. So at that moment, it was just like, what, what do we do? Where do we go? The Ride YMCA family just showed up with tools and hands and said, let us help you um, dig through this stuff. Let us help you find um, precious things that, we maybe, that maybe are still okay. The YMCA is committed to strengthening our community. Together, we have the power to do so much more. As DHS strives to create a new vision, where all Tennesseans can thrive. We look forward to continuing and building on our partnership with the YMCA to transform Tennessee together. The YMCA is remarkable because it offers so many ways to help your neighbor in your own local community. I'm thankful for the Y's work to pave the way for children and for families across the state. 
I hope that everyone would consider getting involved to impact their community. I thought I would, uh, I'm glad I didn't go into the next YouTube video or whatever that was. But no, thank you for um, viewing that. This, this is something that uh, we feel very fortunate to have had the ability to serve in this capacity. We thought it was the right role for us. And, uh, but we know that through the YMCA, we can't do it alone. So it's only through partnerships and collaborations um, that we can serve the communities in the way that we did. So we're very thankful to be able, be able to partner with um, some of the departments, like the Department of Human Services, to provide some of these um, services to the communities that, that need it most. So I just want to thank you for um, seeing some of the work that we've been doing, and we're continuing to meet with the different departments to, to understand how we can continue to use the YMCA as a vehicle to keep serving Tennesseans. So thank you very much for your well, time. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, I think I was one of those at the beginning thought that the Y was just for exercise, but yeah. so I didn't go uh, obviously. But <laughs> but now I see when the, we had the or when the flood came in uh, Humphreys County, well we Dixon actually we had food and the Red Cross set up, and then we had we folded clothes and threw some clothes yeah. away. If yeah. it's something you won't wear yourself, don't give it away. <laughs> Throw <Yeah>. it away. <laughs> but uh, and I know that we have the warming center there as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what they call it, but they do let visitation. You know, when uh, parents have uh, supervised visitation, they let them visit there. And they also have, when they have uh, foster children, sometimes that don't have a place to go right away, they have a, some little bunk beds and things there yeah. for them. So yeah. it's more than uh, than just a why. So, yeah, thank yeah. you for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah that, that why is really playing a significant mm -hmm. role. And, yeah, I got the opportunity to go in one of the vans out there to go right. deliver some of the food, and it's um, if and you I get the chance to do that, it's life changing for sure. I think I so. misspoke about the the children that the foster care. I think they go to the Dream Center at the church next door. I'm getting, them, but the rest of it did, does go on there. So it is a lot more than just an exercise place. So. Thank you, uh, Representative. Uh, a question. Uh, does the Y receive direct, thank you, Ch Chairman, uh, direct appropriations from the state, or does anything just come from grants, or what's the financial relationship? Yeah, good question. So it came from a lot of the uh, American Rescue Plan funds, so, and a lot of those funds came through uh, the department, and so um, we were able to uh, apply for some of those funds through grants, uh, and then um, but there, there are certain situations to where if, um, in our conversations with the department, which have been really good ones, uh, we may say, you know, we have this vehicle of the YMCA in Tennessee that are in communities, you know, is there a way that we can help? And so at that point, um, there, there might be, a, a, we had a contractual agreement with them in order to be able to deliver some of these services. So the feeding program is a part of the USDA program as well. So, um, so but we're, you know, as far as childcare and addressing food insecurity, we're in very deep with that. We are gonna continue to keep um, looking at larger ways because the need, need's only getting greater. Um, one thing others can probably help us with is that we're struggling to have enough staff to, to meet the need. So uh, we're still trying to figure out good ways in order to be able to um, continue to, um, bring others into, into helping. But uh, there's some really great stories to where someone may have been a recipient of some of the services and now are working for the YMCA and passing that forward on to somebody else. So um, <laughs> thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much for being here thank you, and Chairman. sharing. And uh, we appreciate what you do. Thank you. So thank thank you. you for the time. Uh -huh. So we're now back to the session. Do I hear a motion? We adjourn? We are adjourned. We are adjourned.